Rome testing. Rome chapter thirteen, one to seven. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no ter terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from the fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commanded. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath, to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities not only because of the of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. That's also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants, who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone who you own them. If you own taxes, pay taxes. If you, if revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Efficiency, chapter four, one to six. As a prisoner for the law, then I urge you. To live a life worthy of the calling you have received, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. And Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Thank you, Walter, for reading the scriptures for us today. Um, let's continue our sermon series on on the pivotal moment of church history. Let me. IPad. Okay, today is the second of the series called Imper Imperial Embrace. How delicate is the subject of church and politics? Uh, last week, uh, the Southern Baptist Convention, I don't know whether you, you know about it, uh, a lot of Baptist churches in Hong Kong were actually established by missionaries of the Southern Baptist Convention in the 50s through the way, all the way to uh, 70s. So they have a very strong membership uh, formation of 50,000 local churches altogether. And last week they fired their leaders of the uh, Ethics and Religion Liberty Commission, one of the um, key commission under the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, Brent Leatherwood, for his remark about Joe Biden's uh, withdrawal from the presidential election. He held his decision for being selfless and heroic. And then people who disagree with him within the convention uh, want to uh, drag him down. But then they backtracked uh, quite fast. Uh, within the same week, they reinstate him <laughs> to the leadership role. Uh, this episode of the church uh, tells us about the delicacy and the complex of church and U.S. politics. Now, we Christians have always been uh, told um, there should be a a complete separation of church and state, right? 
because we know the pitfalls. When the state and the church are intertwined together, uh, we can have power struggle uh, between the church and the state because we all have our ultimate allegiance uh, to, to authorities. So we serve God and the state serves certain ideologies or uh, beliefs of the nation. So in the Bible, in Acts uh, 5, 29, uh, Peter and other apostles replied to a question of the f of follow fellow believers. What would be our relationship as a new Christian, our relationship to the government? And Peter's reply is that we must obey God rather than human beings. Now that set the stage, the 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 overarching principle for Christians that our ultimate Loyalty should be to God, not to human beings. Well, but we can. We have to be careful that we cannot push this principle to the extent that we ignore the earthly authorities. Now, by authorities, it includes the government and also church authorities or your employers. Because the Bible told, told us uh, these are the authorities and powers established by God. Today we just read Romans 13, um, the, a short passage from verses 1 to 7, which is a classic teaching by Paul about the relationship between the church and the government or people in authorities. For the f first and second verses, it re let everyone be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. So consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Now this is clear, right? This is quite straightforward. But remember the context of Paul writing this, it was in like um, the 60s AD when Emperor Nero, one of the most brutal Roman emperor, was ruling and he was persecuting Christians. He, he used Christians as the scapegoat to shift his, the blame of the Roman people on a Greek fire in Rome, in the city of Rome. So he said, well, it was the Christian who set fire to the, our city. So let's bring them to judgment and justice. So in this backdrop, even when Christians were under per persecution by Nero, he still penned this passage about our relationship and our loyalty to the government, to the earthly government. He said, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. Why? Because they have been established under God's consent and permission. So irrespective of whether they are tyranny, dictatorial, or democratic, each and every earthly authorities are able to exist because of God's permission, at least for, a, for the time being. God did not stir up people, do not stir, stir up our hearts to do something against uh, the will of the authorities. So while our primary loyalty is to God, this doesn't mean we ignore the earthly government altogether, and we have to recognize that God allowed each and every type of earthly government to exist for a reason, to preserve law and order. Isn't it that right even for the authorities we dislike, we don't agree in entirety. Their primary objective is to, is to maintain law and order and peace, right? But they will use different means that sometimes the means may not be uh, pleasant to us. But with this passage, with the teach, teaching of Paul, we will have a standard to measure the deeds and directives of the earthly government. That is to measure them against God's commands from the scripture. 
whether they are doing things aligned with God's teaching and God's value, or they are going against our God. Even though we know that one day Jesus will come back and take over the ultimate leadership of all the authorities. But we, for now, we have to subject ourselves to the earthly authorities. And in verses 3 and 4, what stands out to you in this passage is that the earthly government are all considered by Paul God's servant. Now, this is a qualification and also an implication that they are also subject to God's authority because God is their master. They are God's servants. Whether they are godly governed or not, it doesn't matter. As long as they have the authorities, we have to assume their authorities is ordained by God to some extent. But they are also supposed to serve our God. Whether they know it or not, whether they are a Christian government or not, it doesn't matter. Because God assumes and God expects them to serve his values. If anyone goes against him, anyone who wants to take people away from him, God will do something. God will cause something to happen. But it is God's timing and God's planning that we cannot know in advance. After God created the world, he filled it and he organized it and he gave purpose to everything. But we need people in leadership to govern everything, to put things in order, to put things in perspectives. So each and every government has the purpose of serving God's creation or the greater order. Even though many of the times we find they fall short of the standard. They are not doing a perfect job. In verse 4, God's servant has been repeated twice in this one single verse. But it means they are accountable to God for what they have been doing. The proviso is that each and every government should serve the goodness of God's people. Well, we know, we as God's people, we know what does it mean by God's goodness. That is for God's created being, created order to thrive and to flourish and for them to know there is a God in our life. So anarchy, which means statelessness, anarchy, on the other hand, is harmful and is not something according to God's will. The general rule set by Paul is that Firstly, the earthly authorities are agents of law and order. That's why we have judges, we have lawyers, we have police, and we have legislators. These people work together to maintain a legislative system and judiciary system that, we, that makes sure we have the peace to enjoy our life, to do whatever we want, as long as this is in line with the law and authority. And secondly, civil obedience, which means we comply with the law. Whenever we comply with the law and the regulatory expectations, we comply it not just because of the punishment or the consequences of the law, but because we fear God, because we acknowledge that these are ordained by God. So we have to comply with them. And civil obedience also allow us to live above approach, which means when Christians and churches fall within, align with the law, we set a good example as a good citizen. And then we can have a say to our community. And then the gospel will be heard by people who are willing to listen to us because we, are, we have set the stage for people that or we are law-abiding citizens of our time. Now, when we talk about good citizenship, we talk about we are talking about horizontal grace. Now, when we talk about our relationship with God, we are talking about the vertical grace from God to us. But that is not all. We have to relate to people 
of our standing, that what we call horizontal grace. We have to extend the grace we receive from God vertically to people who we relate horizontally. So who is your labor? Who is your master, employer, or your uh, government? We have to relate to them gracefully. So this is what Paul want us to do. He instructed residents of Rome to be subject to the governing authorities. And the Greek term of submit to uh, is actually a military term, meaning we voluntarily uh, defer uh, to the wishes of another person, which in this context is the one with authorities, with higher power than us. But this term can also be confusing because does it mean that we have to submit and subject to authorities unconditionally because of Paul's teaching? Now I think to a large extent, we have to subject to the authorities, except with a few exceptions that I will talk about later. But we also have to be realistic. The world system and the world government sometimes reward evils. Is that true? Sometimes they reward evils. They use evil deeds to achieve their purposes. And they do oppose God's righteousness. So we don't, we can't be naive that we, we don't, we ignore or we neglect the existence of these evils or wrongdoings among uh, the authorities on earth. And we have to measure the, that this against God's will and his commands. One of the overarching uh, teaching by Paul in Romans about our relationship with the government and also with everyone that we can relate to horizontally can be found in chapter 12, verse 18. Paul said, if it is possible, if it is possible, that is a conditional proviso. As far as it depends on you, which means you have the liberty to make the final decision. Live at peace with everyone. Now it means we, each of us, have the conscience and liberty to make a determination how we want to relate with other people. Whether we want to rebel, or we want to live at peace. I think the wishes of Paul is that we, in all circumstances, by all means, we live at peace with each and every person. Even though there are things that we dislike, things that we find untoward or against God's will. But we have to live at peace with them. And Ephesians 4, the famous passage, which addressed to the church, addressed specifically to Christians. As a Christian, we have a higher order. We have a higher command from God. We are not just ordinary citizens of our city or of our country. We have a higher order to our Lord Jesus Christ because we are considered a prisoner for the Lord. Now, this is a quite a heavy loaded term, prisoner which means you are at liberty, but no, not totally you are at liberty because we, our life is redeemed by Jesus. So we serve our Lord. We serve Jesus. And Paul urged us to live a life worthy of our calling and be completely humble and gentle. Sometimes trouble were caused by proud and arrogance. Sometimes we think we know more than the other people. Sometimes Christians know thinks we are holier than the rest of the world. So we devise. We think we set a higher standard than you. We don't want to follow uh, other people's instructions. But Paul said we have to be humble. We have to be gentle and be patient because we don't have the big picture. We only have a tunnel vision of what is happening in front of us today and in the past. And we don't know the big, big picture of what is going on. Only God knows. So we have to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Again, the bond of peace is critical. Because with peace, we can do a lot of things. 
Imagine if you go against the law, you are imprisoned. How much more you can do with limited freedom? I just went to a prison to visit one of uh, my mentee. Uh, she's uh, about to serve a few year terms in, in the prison. She still has a very positive spirit, but not much she can do except writing letters. Except every week, a few hours. Or no, not a few hours, 30 minutes with a visitor. Not much you can do when you are in prison. So freedom is key. Freedom is key for a Christian. But the call to be a good citizen and subject ourselves to the authority brings up one very, well, near and dear dy moral dynamic to us. Whether we should obey our government un unconditionally, or we have to sometimes answer to our Christian conscience. What is conscience? Conscience is the inner voice in you that tells you what is right and wrong. Now for Christian, our inner conscience does not depend on you, not depend on your moral judgment. It depends on how the Holy Spirit renew, cleanse it, and inspire it. That's why we have to be humble, because no one can trust their own conscience entirely and individually. But sometimes you, th you will wonder, wow, the government has done this and that, which really against morality that we know, that's really against God's will that we know. What are we going to do with that? Especially for those who are experiencing tyranny, experiencing oppression by their own government. What should they do? And what should we do? If we just follow Paul's teaching unconditionally, we could be a naive and could be, we could be out of touch with the reality. In Chinese, we call lei dai, right? We don't want to be lei dai. So we face more dynamics on a daily basis. And we need to know what to do with that. Now, not long after the church movement began, if you were here, um, if you were listen to my last sermon, the first uh, sermon of this series, we talk about Jesus movement in the first century. Not long after this Jesus movement started, in the 40s and 50s of AD, Christians were viewed with skepticism by the Roman um, fellow uh, citizens as anti-humanity because we presented a very different lifestyle. Suddenly these people have their own community, break bread together, serve meal together, pray together. Seems they, they don't come join our fun party of the Roman city. It seems they are anti-human, anti-humanity. So Christians were labeled in the first century as people hate people. Okay, they have to be persecuted. They have to be pro they have to be the target of persecution. So from the first all the way to the third century, the church endured numerous Roman regimes which were high-handed, oppressive, and they faced a very un unfavorable religious and political environment in their growth. The founder, um, Jesus Christ, he was executed. Some of the leaders were executed as well. Church properties were confiscated, the Bible were burned, and people were martyred. So this, at, at the very beginning of the Jesus, of Jesus movement, the church faced a lot of uphill battle, a lot of adversaries. But how could God start a movement like this with all this mess, with all this chaos? But despite all this persecution, from 54 AD all the way to 312 AD, Christianity grew despite of all the persecution. We have ended a long period of chaos where believers have to, cho have to choose to deny their faith 
or to face the consequence of holding to their faith and persecution. Now, there are some important incidents in this, in this long period of the church history that I have only highlighted some of these for you. Nero, we, some of us might have a, an idea of Nero, the emperor, who first started persecuting Christians because of fire in Roman. He find Christians as an easy scapegoat because they don't have a, a strong leader. And because of the alien nation from the public arena, no one speak up for them. No one speak up for the church. So all the hate speech, all the hate rumors spread like fire in Roman, and they become the target for persecution. Isn't that something we find similar in today's social media arena? If someone spread a rumor in the social media and no one come to defend, it becomes a reality. And you become the target for bully. That's exactly what happened in the first century. Nothing new under the sun, according to the book of Proverbs. Peter was martyr, Paul was martyr by Nero. And another emperor, also oppressive emperor Domitian, he exiled John to the island of Patmos, that where John completed the book of Revelation. And towards the end of the first century, a lot of Christian and Christian leaders were martyred, were executed publicly. And the church have grown to such an extent, with such a resilience that they glorify martyrdom. Martyrdom becomes something inspirational for us to hold on to our faith steadfastly. And another emperor, Decius, towards the second century, middle of second century, he launched the first large scale persecution efforts in the Roman Empire. And then followed by Diocletian, Diocletian he initiated the so-called Greek persecution, systematically target Christians and persecuted them. And then into the beginning of first century, another emperor called Gale uh, Galerius. First of all, he continued the Greek persecution efforts, but then somehow God changed his mind. He issued the wording of Edict of Toleration, which tolerate the existence of Christians in the Roman Empire. And Christians have to wait until Constantine the Greek, who, were who was converted as a Christian, and then he issued the Edict of Milan, declaring Christianity as a tolerated and permitted religion within the Roman Empire. Now this is how our early church survived the free, first 300s of the history of persecution. And in the year of three, 325, uh, Constantine the Greek declared Roman city as a Christian city. We need to have a big picture, as I said, as I always said, we cannot have a tunnel vision. Now from Nero all the way to Constantine the Great, we spent 238 years altogether, and we went through 49 Roman emperors. Now not all emperors were oppressive. As you can see from this statistical presentation, which I asked the AI to generate for me with my input of the data to calculate the years of Oppressive years, neutral year, tolerant years, it, it comes up with this um, statistical finding. They act up, with, you act them up, will be more than 250 uh, years because some of these emperors have an overlapping attitude towards Christianity. But anyway, about half and half of these emperors are tolerant or neutral about Christianity and another half are oppressive. So this is the big picture. So sometimes God, when God feel that the rope is too tight for us, for the church, he will raise a tolerant 
or neutral emperor to let the church survive and grab a breath of air for a while. So this hol holistic will tell us that God is in control. But you have a question, why? Why we, have, the church, have been targeted by this emperor? Now, as I said, nothing new under the sun. When you have an emperor as an individual, have all the power of the world in his hand, his philosophy, his religions, and his love for his tradition determine everything else. And some of these emperors want to reinstate the traditional Roman religions, the way Roman worship their pagan gods, and they find Christianity as a stumbling block. So they want to eradicate Christianity from the earth, from the horizon, so that they can have a pure, the purest uh, original tradition and religion of themselves. Cho Sam in Chinese we call Cho Sam. They want to go back to Cho Sam. Does it sound familiar today? We heard about this as well. And many of these have a political agenda to serve, a political purpose. Because Christians are considered outcasts, they want to keep peace and order by eradicating outcasts. So Christian group have always been targeted because they are considered as a threat of national security, that they need to be taken care of, they need to be constrained or confined to a certain extent. And they are a potential of social unrest because they are powerful and they are influential. So at the first beginning, Judaism and Christianity have been separated as a target for a persecution and for monitoring. But the growing number of Christians pose a challenge to paganism and imperialism. So we see that persecution of Christians becoming more and more violent towards the second and first century. So how did the church countermeasure all this persecution? Again, nothing new under the sun, except number four. They go underground, they form small group, they meet at houses, catacomb, which means they meet in cemetery. Okay? They hide their leadership, they conceal their identity, so that no one call them anyone pastor leaders. They just, well, treat each other uh, as, as the same, as equal, so that no one can be singled out for a target. So they avoid detection. And they use symbols, because by using symbols, they were not caught by un unexpected attention. That is why the book of Revelation, when John wrote it in the island of Patmos, is a book highly coded. I mean highly cold, that doesn't mean there are cold in that book that need to be undeciphered um, by us using very mysterious method. It is highly coded by the Old Testament scripture, the Old Testament prophecies, using the Old Testament to inform what they are going through in their century. Another way to overcome that is by community support, they form group, they provide for each other, they visit people in prisons, when they are in prison, to give them support and encouragement to go on. And they also circulate stories about martyrdom, because these stories inspire, these stories encourage people to stay steadfast and affirm that their faith. And lastly, they have to be adaptive, they have to be flexible in terms of the way they worship, practice community structure or fellowship, and allow, allowing them more uh, resilience in face of adversity. But ev even the church have gone through so much, and eventually they were embraced into the imperial family when they were declared as a permitted religion. It, it brings benefit. When the church and the state are so close, it might not be negative. 
it brings about some benefit like um, when the emperor himself converted, many of the royal family were converted. And then the citizen of Rome, they follow. And one of the key incidents happened during this so-called peaceful period of imperial embrace is the so-called Council of Nicaea, which eventually uh, led to the formation or declaration of the Lysine Greed, which is one of the three foundational greed of the church of all the ages. Lysine Greed in Chinese is Lei Sai A Sun Geng, which spell out the foundational doctrines, the foundational belief of churches, and we still follow it uh, up to today. They saw with this peaceful period for the church, they have the time and energy to focus back on church issue, in particular, on the doctrine of Trinity, of the doctrine of Trinity, who is Jesus, is a highly debated and mooted topic of the church. Whether Jesus is a person alone, or Jesus is God alone, or Jesus is God and a person at the same time together, and whether Jesus died on the cross as a person or as a God. All these issues have been debated heavily among Christians. But that some of these debates led to heresy. And the church had to spend some time to resolve it. So, with this short glimpse of the church history for the first three, uh, three centuries, we are sure that God is in control. God has always been in control. Even though sometimes we think, wow, the time is tough. Our government has gone away too, too far away from their original position. But we are reminded by Paul, governments are raised and established as God's servants. They serve God, just as we serve our God. They are accountable for whatever, for whatever they do, but they are also influenced by the evil spirit. That's why Paul in Ephesians said, we are engaged in the spiritual warfare. We are not engaged in the physical warfare with what can be seen. We are engaged in the spiritual warfare with what cannot be seen behind the scene because the principalities of the earth controlled by Satan are against God's will against God's people. But still, we need to have civil obedience. We need to obey as a good citizen to the law and order. But there are exceptions. There are exceptions only in very, very extraordinary situations. What are these? Today, I don't have time to go into detail, but they, there are really exceptions to this general rule that we might have to pick up some radical measure and solutions and fight for God's justice and righteousness. For example, when life and death is at, at stake, when life and death is an urgent matter for us. Like in the, in the 40s, um, when South Africa, from 40s all the way to 1990s, when South Africa practiced apartheid policy, discriminating the black people. And also when there are racist laws in, Am in America that targeted and persecuted the liberties of African Americans in their own nation. People have to pick up a fight to the street. People use civil disobedience to express their voices against the government. We can voice our um, the dissenting views against government policy when this is done within law. We can do this. Because that's why it is important to have a demo relatively democratic government because a democratic government has a system for us to voice our dissenting views and a, a, a transparent and professional law court and judiciary system for us to resolve our disagreement within the law court. But when all these become dysfunctional, 
then that is a different story. So I hope this um, short story, uh, short path journey of our church history can assure us God is always in control. Our situation, we can find our situation resounding with the circumstances of predecessors in the first three centuries of church history. So the church is encouraged to remain steadfast, by all means live at peace with people, with our neighbor, until there is a very extraordinary calling uh, to our heart. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the, the teaching and the scripture that inform us of how we relate to our neighbors, relate to authorities. Father, we really pray for peace. We pray for law and order for our city, for our country, and for the world so that we can, everyone, not just Christian in the church, everyone can enjoy your creation. Everyone can thrive with their talents, creativities, energy, and opportunities. But we also acknowledge that there are times of difficulties, that the, all these wishes, all these intentions from you might not be able to, may not be possible. But we pray that even in those circumstances, in those circumstances that people are suffering, that you are with them. You give them strength, you be with them, comfort them, that even for people who are imprisoned because of their views, because of their thoughts, that they will still have the way uh, to be renewed by the Holy Spirit and to be saved by our Lord Jesus Christ. May you be with the oppressed and with the church. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.